Good morning again. It is stinking good to be here. Okay? Yeah, many of you ask, when am I going to do that? The problem in, in, in Cambodia, see, if I use a lot of my, uh, my phrases and things, and they translate it literally. So if I say, man, that's stinking good, they say, it smells bad? You know, it doesn't make sense to them. And probably some of you, too, are going, what do you mean? But So over there, I've had to eradicate the colloquialisms from out of my, whoa, ho, ho, did I just say eradicate colloquialisms? <laughs> you thought I was just a pretty face. <laughs> But I've, I've had to learn not to use some of those idioms and things to get them out of the way because they, they get in the way of the message. And I don't ever want it to be where they don't understand or get in the way of the message. It's the same, too. I enjoy life. I think we should as Christians. Uh, I like to laugh. I like to have a good time. But I, I always hope that any of our laughter or anything doesn't get in the way of the message because the message is important. And that's what we're looking at today. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. I want, we want to start with the very first verse, and here's what it's going to say to us. You were dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. And see, I pulled up this picture of The Walking Dead. I've, I, I've never seen that show. I know what it's about. It's, it, it's zombies that walk around and try to infect other people and kill them. And they're, they're walking, but they're dead. They're not alive. And that's what he's telling us here in Ephesians. This, this is physically. But Paul is going to tell us spiritually, you were dead. Yeah, you walked and you moved and you had neighbors and you had friends and you went to work and you did these things, but you were dead. Just like the zombie. But the message doesn't stop there. And that's why it's worth hearing. Now, we need to back up and look a little bit just so we, we understand in Ephesians. Ephesians, a, a lot of people broke it down this way. The first half of the book, Paul is going to tell us the great things that God has done for us. He's going to give us our motivation to do what he tells us to do in the last part of the book. And, and I got this outline. I don't mind telling you. I got this outline from a guy named Warren Wiersbe. He does great outlines. They're really phenomenal. He doesn't force it. Okay? Sometimes his books aren't, aren't, aren't great. They're good usually, but his outlines are always great. And his outline for Ephesians just happens to be, be rich. <laughs> kind of like that, huh? But here's what he says, and, he, and he's on target here. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, he's going to remind us of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, our spiritual possessions. And if you read starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And all through these verses then, he's going to say, in Christ, in Jesus, in him, we have these great blessings. I hope you'll, you'll study that and think about that some of your own. Because as long as you're in Christ, that's where the blessings are. If you're outside of Christ, you don't have them. But if you're in them, you have them. And in chapter 2, he's going to remind us of our spiritual position and part of that's what we're going to study today we were dead and now we're alive we were strangers and aliens and we had no hope we were without God but now we're part of the family we're part of the kingdom we're a spiritual temple of God that's what God's done for us and in chapter 3 he's going to he's going to talk a lot about the mystery of how Gentiles and Jews can be together and at the end of that chapter he's going to tell us about the spiritual power we have He's going to say, in, in fact, turn there real quickly and just look. The last two verses. To him who is able to do, starting in verse 20. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we can ask or imagine. According to what? Power that works in us. God's given us a spiritual power too. The power to do, not to do miracles but to do what we need to do in this world, to stand up, to, to be whatever we need to be, that power works in us. And that's what God's done for us. And he's going to say at the start of chapter 4, therefore, anytime you see a therefore, my version says therefore, maybe another one says because. Because 
God has blessed us with spiritual blessings and made us alive and given us hope and given us power, then here's what we need to do. And that's the rest of the book. Now, Wiersbe in his book calls everything walk. And, and that fits exactly what he says. Walk in unity, the first few verses of chapter 4. And then he's going to say, walk is the new man. You put off the old man, put on the new man. So the end of that chapter, he's going to say, speak the truth with one another. Lay aside falsehood, speak the truth with one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let a rotten word come out of your mouth, but only the words that build people up. Walk as the new man. And then he's going to say at the start of chapter 5, walk the walk. And there's three different times that he says walk. In chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, he says walk in, in love. And, and in the section that contains verse 8, he's going to say walk in the light. And at the last part of that, he's going to say walk in wisdom because of what God's done. And then he's going to talk about walking in relationships. And the end of chapter 5 is husband and wife. Treat each other right. Do walk in your relationship in the right way because you were dead, but God made you alive. And he's going to say, fathers, walk with your children. Children, honor your parents because you were dead, but now God made you alive. And he's going to say, employees, masters, and slaves, and, and employees, Treat each other right because you were dead. But now God's made you alive. And at the end of the book, he's going to say, walk as a soldier. Because we're at war. You were dead. You were, as far as a soldier, we were useless. But now we're alive. We need to fight. Now that's kind of a synopsis of the book. But bring us back now to the position that God's given us. We were dead. Now we're alive. Here we go. Chapter 2. Verse 1 says, you were dead. Tim, I forgot. When do I need to stop? Like 12 o'clock? 1 o'clock? <laughs> Got all day? Okay. All right. I, I looked down and went, man, it's nearly 11. You know, I, okay. I'm going to go. If you need to give me the high cutter off here, I can do that. Okay. Okay. Verse 1 says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. And what he's telling us here are, are, are things that you know. He's saying because of your sin, you died. Because who, who's this prince of the power he's talking about? He's talking about Satan. Now, I didn't consciously say, oh, I'm going to follow Satan. I want to be a Satan worshiper. But if I didn't choose God, then I chose Satan. There's two ways to it. I mean, they're, 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 you're just going to be there. So how can he say, there, there's a part of me, there's a part of me that wants to say, how can you say that? I'm not a bad person. Here we go. I'm not a bad person. I haven't, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I don't get drunk every week and beat my wife. And all these, these and, and, and maybe some of us, you say, <laughs> I have done some of those things. But you think, compared to other people, I'm not that bad. How can he say, I'm dead? You know the answer to that when you think about it. The wages of sin is death. James 2 is going to tell us that everybody sins. Okay, maybe you didn't commit adultery, but you broke one of the other laws here. We sin. And you, you add it up. And it leads to death. And there's uh, sin is like cancer. Some of you know that Rhonda had cancer in, in November. It was small, tiny. But if you leave it there, if you don't take care of it, it spreads and it kills the body. And that's what he's telling us sin does. Yeah, you, I look at mine and say, well, that's, compared to someone else, that's not that much but it kills the body. James 1, if you have time to look at this, talks about, he tells us that we're not, we're not tempted by God. We're tempted by our own desires. Okay, someone, someone's rude to me, and my desire says, you can't treat me that way. Okay, and so the temptation comes. And then he says, that if I give in to the temptation, that's when sin is conceived. And you leave it there... Uh, and it gives birth to death, and we die. Because we follow 
the, the, the sin spreads and it affects our body. We're dead. A lot of other verses will talk about this and think about this this way, but you you, you can see this in how uh, if cancer's in your body and you don't take care of it, it's going to spread, and the results can be disastrous. And that's what he says sin does to us. Now, just to make sure we understand, in verse 3, look at what Paul says. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Who's Paul talking about? Who's the we? The we is Paul the apostle, the other people with him, Timothy, Luke, Epaphrodites, the other apostles, Peter. How can he say that about them? We were dead too. You remember what Paul says about himself in Philippians 3? says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, the Pharisee. I was zealous. According to the righteousness in the law, I was blameless. But he says, I was dead too. Why? Because sin killed everybody. You're dead. Now when you're dead, what can be done for you? Nothing. Right? If I go into the doctor and he says, well, you know, your, your, your cholesterol is high and your heart's having trouble, and maybe you need to take some medicine, maybe you need to eat better, maybe, you do, maybe I can do something to make it better. And if I have cancer, maybe I can go and have surgery and have chemo and do things. Maybe the doctor can do things, maybe I can do things, maybe it's, I have some hope. But once you're dead, nobody can do anything for you, including yourself, right? That's how it works physically. When we're spiritually dead, we're helpless. Well, that's depressing if the story ended there. When you start verse 4, what is it? In my Bible it says, but God. You ought to see the times in the Bible. When things seem hopeless, when it seems like there's no way to, to win, when we're surrounded, when, when, when our enemies are everywhere, over and over again in the Bible it, it looks bad and then it says, but God. You know something good's going to happen. We're dead, but God going to do something. Now let me show you this. Do you remember the story in Ezekiel and in Ezekiel 37 about the dry bones, the valley of dry bones? You remember that? Turn over there. We're going to look a, a little bit, make a connection with this. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel had a lot of weird things happen to him. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, visions that God gave him that made parallels that were that were. Uh, parables okay chapter 37 verse 1 Ezekiel's God brings you to the middle of a valley what does he see it's full of bones dry bones like this white dried they're dead they've been dead a long time he caused me to pass among them verse 2 verse 3 God says son of man can these bones live now you know I know the answer to that can the bones live Normally, no, they're dead. Ezekiel knows that too, but he's dealing with God. So he says, God, oh Lord God, you know. And so in verse 4, what does God tell him to do? Prophesy over the bones. So Ezekiel starts prophesying, okay? And, and what begins to happen to him? Verse 7, I prophesied, there was a noise, I began to hear rattling, and the bones started to come together. So Ezekiel prophesies like God tells him, bones live. And they start, I got another picture of bones here too. I like this one. The bones start shaking in places and rattling and rolling. And here they start to, and maybe a, maybe a leg bone over here goes to a guy that's over here. And so it zips across and sticks with him. 
and bones are coming together here and they're starting to move. What do you think Ezekiel's thinking? Oh my. Wow, to watch this. And bones, and, and you see all of these, and they're coming together. And you keep reading. In the next verse, um, verse 8, they start to have flesh on them. The skin covers them. They're, they look like people. Hundreds and thousands in this valley. Are they people yet? Do they have life? No, no breath yet. So in verse 9, God tells him to breathe the breath of prophecy. So he breathes as, as he prophesies, as God commands, verse 10. And what do they do? They come to life, they stand on their feet, exceedingly great army. What has God done? He's brought life where there was death. Now, here's the explanation. Let God explain it. This is not me saying it. Verse 11, son of man, these bones are the house of Israel. They say our bones are dried off, our hope is perished, we're completely cut off. Verse 12, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 13, You will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you in your own land. Then you know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. What's this? This is an example. God is telling them, you're spiritually dead. You feel like you're, 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 you have no hope, but I will rescue you. And this is a parable, an example for us that we can be dead, and God loves to rescue us and bring us life. And that's what, he's, what Paul's saying in Ephesians. Because of our sin, we were dead. We were helpless. We were just like this valley of dry bones. There was nothing we could do to live but God. Now I'll go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, what did he do? Made us alive together with Christ. Just like those bones came to life, we spiritually come to life in Christ Jesus. Why did this happen? Because of God's great love and mercy. He's going to go on and tell us more about how this fits for us. He's, he's seated us with Christ. And this is sometimes a hard thing for us to grasp because we see things linearly. We see things on the planet. We see things physically. And we don't always realize there's spiritual going on here too. When God makes us alive, he seats us with Christ. So we are seated with Christ in the kingdom right now. You say, but I'm on the world. I'm, I'm on the world. I'm in the world. That's right. But God's kingdom is in heaven and on earth. We are seated with Christ now. Now we'll have eternal life that will go on forever, but it starts when we believe, when we become Christian. We're seated with Christ. And he shows us the riches of his grace, verse 7, because whatever We've done whatever our sins are, however bad our cancer was, and that our death, it's forgiven. That's the grace. And we need to understand that he's going to talk about grace. He's going to say, here we go, yep. He's going to say three times so that we don't miss it, that we're saved by God's grace. Look at him again, verse 5. We were dead in our transgressions. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 7. In order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. By grace you have been saved. Not of yourself. How have we been saved? By grace. How were we made alive? By something we did? By God's grace. We were the bones. And he said, I want him to live. I want her to live. 
come to life. And we need to try to grasp that and understand it. We, we were dead with no hope. And God made us alive. Some people, I've heard people say before, you know, I need to do all that I can and then let God's grace do the rest. I understand the thought behind that, but it's wrong. God's grace is 100% of it that makes us alive. It's God's grace. Now, I have to stay in Him I have to believe in him. I have to be faithful. I know that. But it's not me doing everything I can and God's grace taking it. It's God's grace is 100%. And I need to understand that. Look again at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, my part in this is faith. And, and, and there's some other verses that talk a lot about this, okay? And, and we'll see some of them. Uh, um, I, I didn't have time to go through and shorten some of this down. A lot of verses will pop up in a minute that talk about faith. Our side of it is faith, to believe. God's side of it is grace that makes us alive. How we accept that is our faith. But it's, it, it, it's our faith that saves us. It's God's grace that saves us. He's, he says here clearly, not the works that we do. It's a gift from God. Look at verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. Are we saved by our works? Shake your head, no. No. And, you're, and, and, and it's not me that said that, okay? It's right here. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. That's, what, that's how God's made us alive. Now, I want you to see many, many verses that are going to talk about grace and faith. And, and, and I meant to, I got to busy with other people and I meant to go back and, and condense this down some. Um, yesterday and I didn't do it so we're not going to try to cover all of these verses but I just will remind you of some of these of some of these things okay I know in James 2 it says faith without works is dead that's right okay if you really truly believe something you're going to do that you're going to show that okay but he's telling us in Ephesians that it's our faith that saves us not the works now to kind of build on Scott's example if I really, really love my wife, then I'm going to do things that show her that. But, but, but that's not the love. I, I, I love Because I love her, I do that. And that's part of what he's saying in some of these verses. I know in, in uh, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job with this part, and I really want to. There's a lot of verses here. We can't cover all of these. In Romans 3, He's going to tell us that, that, that we are not justified by our works. We're justified by our faith. In, in Romans 4, he's going to talk about Abraham. And he's going to say, was Abraham justified by his works? No, justified by his faith. In Romans 9, he's going to say some more about that. In, in, in multiple times in Galatians and other places, he's going to talk about us being saved by our faith, which is our part to God's grace, not by our works. But let me give you two more quickly that show this. 2 Timothy, please turn in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. I need 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. God has saved us and called us to holy calling, not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. What has God called us to? A holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his grace. Now turn over a page or two in Titus chapter 3, and verse 9. I said verse 9, verse 5. God has saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, 
but according to his mercy, by the washing, by the re regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Has he saved us based on the deeds that we've done? Nope. Saved us according to his mercy and his grace. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Does that mean we can do whatever we want? Chapter 2, verse 10. He's going to answer that. He's going to say we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works. Which, he is, which God prepared for, beforehand that we should walk in them. So what are we supposed to do? Good works. We're supposed to do good works because we're responding to God's grace. He made us alive. If, um, in, in, in Romans chapter 6, some people seem to have the question, Okay, since God's grace is so big, can I go do whatever I want to do because his grace will cover me? And you remember how Paul answers that? God forbid! No! Why would you go and do that? And you remember Peter talks about someone who's, who's faithful already and then he goes back to the world. What's he like? Like a dog that pukes up and then go licks, goes and licks it. Ooh, that's delicious. Okay? Why would you go back to doing things? He said, no, no, no. Don't go back to that. We're called to do good works. We're called to, sh to show that we're like Christ. If we're going to wear the name Christian, then we ought to be like Christ. Two verses to remind you of that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. You know this very well. God says, Jesus says, you're the light of the world. What does the light do? It shines. What are we supposed to shine for? Look, oh, turn over there quickly. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 16, I want you to see this part. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they will do what? See your good works. And once they see your good works, what will they do? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So because we've been made alive, go do good works so that people will glorify God. And maybe more of the zombies will come in to have life. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, John is going to remind them, if you claim to be a Christian, what should you do? You should act like Christ. Look over there. Let me read that to you quickly. 1 John chapter 2, starting verse 5. Whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him, in Christ ought to himself to walk in the same way that Christ walked. So do what Christ did. Do the works. Because we believe. Because we know we've been saved by God's grace. So here it comes back around. We were dead. Nothing we could do about it. If you did a thousand good works a day for a thousand years, it would not save you. You're dead. You're the dry bone. And me too. But God came because of his rich mercy and grace and said, I want you to live. And so the bones rattled and the skin came back on and the blood came and he gave us life and he said, you're alive. Now go and act like it. It ought to matter to us because it ought to motivate us to know we were dead. Now we're alive. We're living for Christ. 
It also needs to help us because a lot of our friends and co-workers and people we know and people we love, they're the walking dead. And they need to know Jesus. And the best way for them to know it is by your life and my life. And then they're going to want to be alive too. That's what we want. I always hope in my lessons, especially in this one, that I encourage you. I know it encourages me. Remember your motivation. We were dead. God made us alive. Go live for him so that other people will want to be alive too. Today, if you need to respond to Jesus in any way publicly, we always give you the chance to do that. I hope in our hearts we've been stirred by God's word to thank God for what he's done and to trust in him for what he calls us to do if you need to respond publicly please come now while you stand and sing